Okay, my, my name is Martin Hutchings. I retired from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department about oh, five years ago. Uh, I was the bomb squad supervisor there for about the last 12 years. So I've been on quite a few calls, uh, probably I don't know, three or four hundred different calls involving actual explosive devices or IEDs, whatever you want to call them, improvised explosive devices. Um, since then, I've been working part-time with NIST, and actually within NIST is the Office of Law Enforcement Standards. And the reason I've been doing this is because that old saying, we're from the federal government, we're here to help, well, which it kind of really is true. A lot of times, though, they don't know how to help, and so what I've been doing is helping the Department of Homeland Security, who was funding this project for NIST, and with NIST, in being like a conduit between the National Bomb Squad Commander's Advisory Board and the federal government and giving them ideas on what state and local bomb squads need. Um, so uh, Raymond asked me to come and give this talk on robotic use with bomb squads. So that's really what I'm going to kind of emphasize uh, is how bomb squads use robots, how they use large robots, how the use of smaller robots is really coming into play more. And uh, so really what I want to talk about is these areas here. This, the U.S. Bomb Squad Special Programs, which I'll, I'll kind of I'll, I'll explain what that is. Large and small robot use, uh, how we've kind of really changed to where we now operate a lot more with SWAT teams and use of robotics standardized skills and training. Um, what we want to do is come up with a program using the standardized test methods that are being developed at NIST now to where we can use those standardized test methods having to do with vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices and then use it for training for bomb squads. Uh, I want to talk about some of the specialized tools that are used on robotics when uh, for bomb squad need needs end up how uh, robots save lives and I'll show you an example how it could have and I also have some response videos that I want to show you. The, all these videos are from actual calls that I was on uh, long quite a while back we recorded everything on VCR tapes so I took these VCR tapes to a place had them transferred into a DVD to the uh, DVD format so I could show them to you. Uh, just a quick background within the United States we have a kind of a convoluted system on um, bomb squads. It's not quite as cut and dry like the USAR teams that were set up. Um, we, the bomb squad system is set up to where any state or local entity can generally have a bomb squad. So back in 1998, we came to the conclusion that we really had no standardization of training, of squads, equipment, things like that. So we developed uh, the National Bomb Squad Commander's Advisory Board and from that we also developed a system of accreditation for bomb squads and certification for bomb techs. So all bomb techs in the United States go to the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama to a school there, it's a six week school now on uh, becoming a bomb tech. Every accredited bomb squad, and there are 457 accredited bomb squads from throughout the United States. All the accredited bomb squads have to have certified techs, and then there is a minimum amount of equipment. One thing that we instituted, because I was on the National Bomb Squad Commander's Advisory Board, it's an elected board, there's 12 members that represent all the bomb squads throughout the United States, so I was on that for six years. And we made a, a determination in 2009 that to re-accredit yourself, you had to have a robot. So every bomb squad has to have a robot. And we didn't make up a determination of how big this robot could be. You could actually, it just couldn't be a little toy. You know, so it had to be a regular, some type of a regular robot. But it could, it could be a small one. So, at least now, all 457 bomb squads do have some robotic capability. Um, years ago, bomb squads were just 
pretty basic. We went out on improvised, uh, maybe fireworks that somebody's made into something, uh, small pipe bombs. It was, it was kind of basic. But since then, we've really kind of morphed into these nine special program areas. And I'll explain this to you real quick. At the top, VBIED, that would be Vehicle Born Improvised Explosive Device. PBIED would be Person Born Improvised Explosive Device. And so if you have something like the, um, the vests, things like that. RCID, Radio Controlled Improvised Explosive Device. And then under that is Electronic Countermeasures, ECM. Standoff weapons, we really haven't seen anything like that in the States, but the possibility is there if somebody can make like some improvised mortars and lob them in. Military ordnance is turning into be a big issue. A lot of uh, uh, hand grenades, uh, uh, old ordnance is being turned into bomb squads, or they have to go out there and try to determine what to do with it. Maritime is turning out to be uh, uh, another big issue. How do we go out and work on ships? How do you go out, and, and by maritime, I'm not talking actual diving, but you know where you're just around the water. Uh, PPE, WMD issues, uh, as I already mentioned, the bomb SWAT integration, and then another one that's turning out to be a big area is this whole thing with uh, homemade explosives. Um, so, of those nine, these five here are much safer using robotics. The vehicle born, person born, RCIED, SWAT, and homemade explosive. So the most difficult one for us is going to be here on the VBIED. And the reason for that is on cars or vehicles or trucks, you can use so much more explosives than somebody could carry on their person. So the ability to have hundreds or thousands of pounds of explosives in a vehicle is there. The other big issue is uh, the volume of the explosive, the size of the vehicle, and the concealment. You get these in there, you can pack other things around them, you put them in a trunk. So all of these things are tough to get at and to work on. We have made a concerted effort on the VBIED part of it to use robotics. So the number one thing that you're going to try and do if you're dealing with the vehicle-borne improvised explosive device, or a potential one, and keep in mind, just a potential one is going to be just as difficult to roll it out as a real one. So that has become our number one target is to work on uh, a, a challenge is VBIEDs. So we want to use robots. We are working now, uh, like I mentioned, with, with Adam over at his shop in coming up with standardized test methods on what is a VB, VBIED capable robot. So we've got together a workshop. We've come up with um, different things that we feel that a VBIED capable robot should be able to do. Because as of now, what we have is the manufacturer's opinion or their uh, word that, hey, our robot can do this, our robot can do that, and then we want to really put them out there and find out they really can't do these things that they said that they do. I mean, they may have said this in good faith, but, but, but they really don't have that ability. Um, RCIEDs, radio control, very, very dangerous when you on something like this when you double it up with a VBID, because now you not only you're going up on a potential t uh, target that could carry a lot of explosives, but that potential that somebody could set it off uh, from a distance away. So we've come up with this this hope that we're gonna that we're gonna have a VBID capable response robot using the standard test methods program. One thing that in the past for bomb techs, the training has always been slow and deliberate. You always said time's on your side, slow and deliberate. Well, that's really not the case anymore if you're dealing with the vehicle-borne um, improvised explosive device because that potential of such mass destruction and uh, as far as killing people is there. So we're trying to get things changed around more that we have 
a, more of a rapid aggressive assessment mode. And then so that's kind of the term we're using, rapid aggressive assessment, where you can get there right away with the robot, get it off, and get down there and try to look in there and see what you can see. So at least you're doing something right away. So when it comes to uh, VBI capable robots, you need something that's capable of carrying tools down to break windows. Uh, when we were out recently at the Sponsor Commanders Conference, we came across another entire, uh, entirely different tool that seemed to work real well. Uh, in the past, we've had like these window punches. You go up there with a the window punch and it doesn't work very well because you have to get it right on top of it at a 90 degree angle to get in there and break that window out and, and it's just not working very well. Well, we found out another company has made one that actually shoots these little tiny BBs and it breaks the, window, the glass real well. A pan, uh, deploy a pan or disruption tool. A pan is like a, a basically a shotgun barrel, and it shoots different things. One of the, th the items that it shoots more o most often is water. You use like a shotgun shell charge, it propels the water out, and it breaks or disrupts or tears apart a package. You could uh, use that disruptor and come up here and say, shoot this uh, projector right there with the water charge, and it's going to rip it apart. The idea of that is if you can go up there to some type of a device, whether it be a car, and I'll show you some videos on this in a minute, or a vehicle or something small, you rip it apart, tear it apart before it has a chance to explode. Uh, operating the manipulator through a window, carrying and delivering a disruptor tool and being able to place it under a vehicle or under a trunk, towing. Uh, I think Adam kind of touched upon that uh, the other day when he was talking about towing. If you wanted to tow some type of a cart with uh, explosive charge alongside the vehicle, which would go up and tear the vehicle apart. And as I just mentioned, offloading the robot, putting some weapons on it, and then going up downrange within 20 minutes and getting, you know, doing some business, getting get in at it. Um, robot use by bomb squads. A lot of it depends upon the cost. Uh, a big robot costs obviously a lot more than a small robot. Um, but for our needs, in my opinion, a big robot is better than a small robot because it has so many more capabilities. It's stronger, uh, the ability to go up and break open doors, break open windows, and again I'll, have, I'll show you what I'm talking about with the video on this uh, a little bit later. You, there's a lot more tools and adapters that you can put on it because some of these tools, these specialized tools that we put on a robot are very heavy. And so you need something that's strong. The, the ability to push and pull, higher reach, lifting, and I think overall better mobility through um, terrain if you're outside. So what I want to do now is just go through quickly and show you some different pictures of <coughs> robots that have come up. This is one that is in a museum up in uh, Maryland. And this one here is, I think, is from the early 50s. I forgot to look at it when I took the picture. But just to kind of show you that robotics have been around for a long time for, um, for robot, I mean, for bomb squad use. So this was one of the very early bomb squad robots. And you can see here, instead of a disruptor, what they were using there was a shotgun to, for the disruptor. Remote Tech, this was out at the uh, Bomb Squad Commanders Conference. This is their lineup of robots, new one for, I think, 2012. Another Remote Tech, this is very difficult. When I was talking about things for bigger robots, if you get something like this can of gas here set behind, what we do is we set this up behind this um, seat to have this robot go in there push that seat forward and lift that out is very difficult because the it, it's just it's it's hard to grip it the top of it and for the robot to get up there in that position they can't hardly get their gripper through the handle if there was a handle this particular can did not have a handle that went through it was just a plastic one on the top so this was very difficult to do and you can see this is one of uh, Remote Tech's bigger robots there. It took that one to be able to lift that out of there. How did those seats get forward? He lifted them up. Really? It was just a little handle on the side. He kind of lifted them up and pushed them forward. So yeah, nobody, there was no help done and he actually opened the door too. 
if you want to get in for inspection, get a bigger robot, higher lift, ability to get up on something like a bus and get inside there and take a look. This is uh, one by uh, Alan Vanguard. Uh, they've had some issues with this one. It's not really being sold in the States yet, but I wanted to get a picture for them just to kind of show you that this is just another view of a larger robot. They say that they are selling them overseas, but I, I don't know. Anyway, they have some work to do on it. This was done by Kinetic. All of this is, I guess you would say, commercial off the shelf, Th this entire vehicle here. What they have done is added this remote control part up here. So if, if uh, a, a bomb squad wanted to have this, say, as a regional asset, where if you had a vehicle, something that you just wanted to go up and stab it here with these forks, reach in and rip it apart, or go to a side of a, uh, a, a truck van and just basically grab it and rip a hole in it. That's how they, th that's how they came up with this idea. But they wanted to do it remotely using this so because if you're dealing with the vehicle, the potential of a big explosion is there. Or possibly moving the whole vehicle. Or possibly moving the whole thing. That's very true. If it's yes. Right, right in front of or next to the building. And uh, there's quite a few squads have come up with heavy duty um, fork forklifts that they've actually modified to do exactly that. Uh, the Theodore, just kind of, uh, these are very well made robots. They are, have sold uh, real big in Europe, but they haven't quite caught hold yet in the States because the remote tech line is being used at the Hazardous Devices School where we all go and train. That's what everybody goes down there, and in fact, when you get on there for your six weeks at the Hazardous Devices School, one week of that is robot training. So this is another one here. This is the Telemax and the Theodore. Both of those are much better robots than the most popular ones. But the bad thing is they're usually a little more expensive and they don't quite have the service uh, ability that the, the remote tech line does. This is another one that's caught on uh, i -Core for kind of a medium-sized robot, these three. They're uh, fairly inexpensive, they go fast, and they, for a lot of squats, this is a choice because they can still get the, uh, they could have still got a robot to meet that, requ that 2009 requirement. Okay. This is, I'm going to show you using a large robot on a VBID. Detonated next to a vehicle containing explosives, dispersing the vehicle contents without initiating the main charge in the VBID. The array of debit modules is easily. Okay. This is a new uh, device that's just been recently worked by Stanford Research Institute. In the past, all of the render safe tools that we have used have used water. Water is very heavy, very cumbersome. You get out on a scene, it's hard to come by. So one of the requirements that we came up with was trying to use, come up with some type of a tool that did not use water. This tool is made, this was a, uh, a, a um, prototype and they use powdered PETN, which is a high explosive, and polystyrene beads. And they also use another item in there called Purple K, which is a fire suppressant. So we went out and we've been working with uh, SRI, Stanford Research, on this. And so this was a, a uh, in fact, one of the guys in Sacramento Sheriff came up with this rig, this little um, towing device there, and the ability to drop it down, set it off. and. I could just kind of show you this, but I mean, if you guys are like me, maybe you like to see some stuff blow up too. So I just went ahead and kind of put the whole rest of it uh, on there when this thing goes off. Under the vehicle with a robot. Debit modules have been successfully demonstrated on box trucks and semi trailers. In this test, an array of debit modules has been placed under a semi trailer 
containing nine drums of ANFO. The debit tool has ejected all the drums from the vehicle without initiating any of the ANFO. The drums and other IED components can easily be inspected with a robot to ensure that it is now safe to approach the vehicle. I don't know. Do you want to wait? Uh, well, is the purpose of this disruptor, is it to uh, basically dismantle it yes. or without yes. actually blowing yes. uh, what is inside? Yes. Because so explosive this purpose. It, it doesn't uh, initiate an explosion of what well, is inside. Well, that's, that's, we that's one of the things that we were trying on this. Okay. Because ANFO, they had ANFO and they actually had boosters in there. They are set off by shockwave, uh, basically, you know, by, by uh, another explosion. So one of the experiments on this was to make sure that we could use this debit charge not only to eject them, but they actually had the, the cans filled with ANFO to make sure that it did not set off the ANFO. So it was a two-fold. But if you're using homemade explosives, something like that, just about every time you shoot it with the disruptor, it's going to set it off because they are so much more sensitive than something like ANFO. And that's the last resort. Yes. This is the last thing they want to do. Okay, on this one here, just to kind of give you an idea what I was telling you about as far as a big robot needing some beef. They're right there. We, we, uh, I, I kind of cut this down, but that was a big sliding glass door there. And we were working with the SWAT team. We had a murder suspect in there that wouldn't come out. So we went up with the robot, rammed the sliding glass door, and broke it out. So now they're backing up a little bit, trying to figure out what they're going to do. And what we want to do is get behind these blinds that are here, all these, these uh, blinds hanging down, and get in there and look. So the, 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 the light was too bright. That's another thing that, that happens a lot of times. You get in there, and the, and, and the light is too bright, and it's too dim, and then it's kind of hard to find that happy medium. So, so he's looking right there and there he kind of found it. But you can see all the glass down there. And so sometimes you just have to use brute force and a larger robot generally is able to do that. And in the case generally with working with SWAT teams, what they want us for is the observation ability, to go in there and see what we see, or something like this where we actually put it in there to look for the suspect. So we got in there, Okay, now we're kind of looking around, and they're calling the guy on the phone, telling him to come out. He didn't even, when he starts coming out, he didn't even really realize the robot was there. I think he was so tweaked out that uh, he didn't know the robot was even there and that it had broken out the, the uh, sliding glass door. So there he comes out, talking on the phone. So we're able to tell the SWAT team, he does not have a gun in his hand. The only thing he's got is a phone. He's coming out now and they, so they can take him into custody. This wasn't a hostage situation. This was no, just a, bad guy. just a guy holed up in there, not wouldn't come out. Okay, on smaller robots, smaller robots definitely have a place because. You can use them very well as like a second set of eyes. And it works great if you go up there with your main robot doing some work here, you have another robot set off to the side because what's really hard with the bigger robot is that whole depth perception. How close you're getting to something there with, uh, when you're trying to manipulate something. So if you have another robot set off to the side where you can see what the gap is in between, it's, it really, really does work out nice. Um, so for bomb squads, it's becoming more popular to, to get these. 
A lot of times, though, squads are buying them as the second robot because then they don't need a, some sort of a big dedicated vehicle to carry them around. They can maybe carry them around in their response vehicle that they drive on a daily basis. Uh, an extra set of eyes, a throw type. Again, those are becoming a little more popular, and I have a video I'll show you that in use. And then the mobility man portable. You, a lot of times you want something that maybe you can pick up and carry from one point to another point. But it, as I mentioned, it's usually not the primary robot. Uh, this was a disaster city, just to kind of give you an idea of a bunch of small robots lined up. This one here is Mesa, uh, and the, it's called the Matilda. The one here at the bottom is, this is they've sold probably thousands of these. They're fairly inexpensive. It's made by uh, Recon Robot. It's a scout. They call it a throwbot. Uh, I think uh, you saw this in the last video, that's the point man. Again, these are very popular for um, just putting in because they work well. This one up here is uh, Lithos, it's called a Sentinel, and iRobot. First, First, First look, down here. So all of these, these three and the two before it are basically just for observation. They're not to get up there and really do anything. They're just to get in there and take a look, which is very important. By the way, that point man, upper left, is what I showed in the step fields yesterday, I guess. We found that robot first in a competition in the U.S. in like 2003, 2004 time frame. And they've been refining and refining and refining ever since. They work well. Yeah. When we talk about the term man portable, well, you can see this is woman portable, portable also. And that is the Kinetics uh, Dragon Runner. Which these are, in, in fact, uh, the Sacramento Sheriff's Department and the Sacramento Police Department both bought one of these uh, about a year ago. And originally, so a lot of these robots were made where there's just the platform and just a camera on it. And then they've kind of changed and they, you can also add on the upper part where you can put on a disruptor. <coughs> Who bought those? The Sacramento okay. Police Department and the Sheriff's Department, both. Okay, to show you also, if you have the right tools to go along with it, this is a small robot. Um, Problem. Several witnesses placing the same debit charge under a van parked in front of the state capitol. The witnesses saw two men get out of the van and enter a second vehicle that drove them away. This appeared suspicious to them, so they looked into the van and could see one or two 55 gallon drums. They called 911. An officer arrived, ran the plate, and found the vehicle was stolen. He looked inside and saw cords going into the drums in the van. He immediately called the bomb squad. The first bomb tech that arrived broke out the window and saw four drums with detonation cord looping from one drum to another. After the bomb tech's rapid aggressive assessment, he reported his findings to the patrol watch commander and the bomb squad commander. The bomb squad commander determined that a fast remote attack was necessary. A four block area evacuation was started. A command post was set up three blocks away. This was the first An time we... remote action was started against this vehicle-borne IED to render it safe using the Dilute Explosive Blast Innovative Tool, also called DEBIT. This was the first time we used uh, the DEBIT, the DEBIT on a vehicle. The big one with the truck was later on. ...inexpensive remote control robot. The robot can be controlled from a line of sight distance <laughs> up to one half mile. For guidance, the robot has a camera viewed by the operator. The robot pulls the cart with the debit modules under the van. If a larger robot were used, it would carry the debit modules to the van, set them down, and push them under the van. Just like I showed you earlier. The debit system is much lighter and easier to place than other BPIED neutralization tools. A solenoid is used to release the robot from the cart, and the robot is driven away. The countdown begins. Five. Four, three, two, one, fire! So that's how the best.
best way that we have available to today to render safe a vehicle bomb, believe it or not. The debit modules completely opened up the van and threw all the drunk. It's pretty crude, but it generally works. And this is back to that uh, showing you in action that uh, yeah, we, got, we have a white abandoned vehicle. I have stopped. I got a whole oh, recon scout. They knocked that. out this video and kind of cropped it and sent it to me. So okay, I got this mount. <coughs> it's small, but you know there's a purpose for it. Now we've got a trunk, and left, clear, and right, clear, and forward. Center line's clear. Left wheel's clear. So we have an underbody search test method that's been introduced into Robocop. It doesn't necessarily need to be that small, it's variable height. Remember a tractor trailer, which is the other thing they blew up, is a meter high. There's a lot of room underneath. As a matter of fact, where the small robots start losing their visual, their near field visual beauty, somewhere near a meter, where it becomes a problem for them to work, some of the larger robots actually might do better in that job, depending on the size of the vehicle. Um, what's also important there is you're always, by definition, looking upward with a bright sky behind you. So when you get to the edge of the vehicle, the dynamic range of your camera becomes really important. But you watch out because of the sun in daylight. Okay, I kind of touched upon this a little bit earlier at the standardized skills. What we're trying to do is come up with a program using, like I said, the VBID test methods once they get uh, completely finished and worked out, where we can send these out and have bomb techs practice these test methods. Because what that gives is the bomb squad supervisor the, the ability to measure that tech's skill. And so it's not just their, the supervisor's uh, opinion that, you know what, you, you're not really good on this. You, you can actually do these things and see how well the person does and compare them to the overall rating of an expert. So these are some of the different uh, skills that we are looking to use. One is reaching in and picking up uh, a, a um, container full of liquid there to simulate say a gas container and how far you know can the robot reach in there and do that well this would also we if you used it for uh, skill um, development it would also give you that ability to see how well you could do that the other is looking inside a, a simulated door of a vehicle the underbody search Uh, examining inside these uh, barrels. This is another robot that just came out recently. It's still not quite uh, perfected. It's called the Black Eye. And the, this one was made at beginning just the base down here. And then the military came back with a requirement said, we need a robot that's a lot stronger. This is a very strong robot compared with the other ones that are being used. So they actually built this top part on it to go on there later on. Okay, when it comes to tools, this is very important for uh, Bomb Squad robot use. What type of tools can you put on the robot to help you do the job better? So some of the ones that we've uh, come up with, uh, the different requirements, are cutting tools for metal and cloth, and uh, spreaders. They've actually come up with the device, and I'll show it to you. It's like a Jaws of Life, where you can get in there and spread these apart, 
and uh, really do some uh, good things. Window breakers, towing, lifting, drilling. That's just an example of one tool kit that one uh, manufacturer sells. That's it uh, on a robot where they're putting one of the cutters on there trying to cut this belt off and then cut off the jacket to see whether if you had a person that is down that you thought might be carrying some explosives. This is a, an example, this is called a power hawk. Um, this tool is one of the uh, adapters, and I'll show you the whole one in, in just a second, but that's one of the adapters uh, that you can put on there. These vehicles, this, this has enough power to go there and actually cut that entire handle off the back end of that truck. I mean, they're very powerful. So that's another way to maybe be able to get up to a vehicle and examine it. This in here is the spreader where you get it in there and it actually just starts spreading, tears toward the entire door off this vehicle. Uh, window breaker went up and shot this and uh, broke out this window, broke out the back one. All of these are, some of these sound kind of simplistic, but they really, they're kind of hard to do sometimes and they're very important. Uh, for the work of the bomb tech. So to be clear, all the explosions shown so far are the absolute last resort. They do not want to do that. They want to do what it, they're calling a fast assessment, a rapid assessment, which means break the windows out and clear all the nooks and crannies inside. <laughs> then, if they saw something, they would much prefer to stick an arm in there that could at least target the power supply or the electronics. Of the, of the device to elegantly render it safe. Do not want to blow the thing up. Look at that arm. When, when you realize why they might be thinking about blowing up the whole vehicle, it's because they're trying to stick arms that look like that into vehicles. Right? So what I would say is there's obviously a role for all sizes of robots. You do not have to try to ultra-miniaturize your robot to fit necessarily an application. But be elegant about it. Be elegant about what you're doing, be robotic about it, be uh, reliable and efficient, and they will find a place to put it. They will find what it does well, we will measure it so, and they'll know exactly how to use that tool. That one, of the, one of the bad things about a lot of these different tools, a lot of these manufacturers had these tools already. So then you look and you say, oh, wow, I, somebody told me I could maybe use this for bomb squad purposes. So you kind of try to put this square peg and fit it in the round hole, and sometimes they don't really work as well. But you know that's that's what we're stuck with a lot of times. Uh, towing ability. This is a um, a portable X-ray unit that they've spent millions on trying to develop. It still doesn't work very well. Very difficult. This is a, um, a, a it's called electroadhesion. You get it up there and it would stick to the side of the vehicle holding the explosives on it if you needed to, to do it that way. Like Adam said though, it maybe is the last resort. But this is very heavy It's because it uses water. So the, like, even this bigger robot here could not pick this up and do that because it would just tip the robot forward too far. So uh, one of our guys came up with this, uh, like a fulcrum or a contraption here to distribute the weight a little better. So all of these I'm showing you are, a lot of these are challenges that we have with robotics in using tools with it. Because a lot of times a robot can't do it by itself. It has to have help. And by the way, that piping right there, all that white piping developed by the bomb, tech, the bomb squads that were trying to fix a problem, or adapt a new solution to an old robot. That is the most elegant interface I've ever seen that they came up with between a new tool and an old robot. Right? They need help with that kind of those those tools also. Yes. Um, just to give you another one, inspection tool. Um, this came up a drilling tool. Well, as you can see, look how massive this thing is here just to drill a hole through there. The idea was to drill a hole through there and then insert some type of a camera in there for inspection. Uh, I think this one here, oh, this, this shows you that entire 
um, power hawk unit. You have this very heavy unit back here with batteries and the power and everything, and then it would go up there, and then this is the big uh, unit up there that either would have your spreader or your cutter or something on it. I think this one here, we were trying to use some sort of monitoring device at the end of it and stick it in there. So obviously there's no attention paid to the center of gravity of that entire system because it's all kind of made up ad hoc, right? So that's what I mean by being elegant. Okay, this shows you, we went out on, on this, why it's good. If you're going to go in a call, put as many tools on the robot as you can. Because we went in on this call, we thought the guy was dead, uh, using it with SWAT team, and then we got in there, found the door lock, and then we just had to again resort to brute force. We started just getting back there and ramming the door instead of taking the time, you know, we didn't want to have to come all the way back out again, put a disruptor on there so we could shoot the handle and the lock. And as it turned out, the guy was. He, uh, he was wanted for something and he killed himself and he was right inside the door there. But you can see, at least we got, we did, we were able to do it just by getting up there and keep ramming the door until we broke it apart. So one of the reasons why they don't want to go back out to the truck to put a new tool on, obviously in this case it's probably mostly just about time and speed. Well, you got a bunch of people standing around there saying, let's go, let's go, you know, and the and they, well, SWAT teams get impatient because really they don't want us to do this. They want to run in there, you know, with uh, guns blazing and, and uh, do their SWAT stuff. But it's also really hard for them to operate these robots in any kind of unknown environment. To get down the hallway and up the two stairs and around the corner that no. it took to get to that position, beads of sweat on the operator because they didn't have any kind of centering between obstacle, low-level behavior that would have improved his efficiency, kept him off the walls, uh, any stair climbing behaviors that would you know help them get up and down the stairs safely, stow the arm properly in advance of doing anything aggressive. All these background assistive features would just improve their overall performance. That's what they're looking for. It's not full autonomy, it's just help or remote on, operation. On this next video, this one was one we went in with plenty of tools on it. Went up to the front door. Uh, they, this guy was holed up in there, hadn't heard from him for hours. We thought he had also killed himself. So we went up there to, with the idea of going in there to see if we could find him. And the idea is, if you haven't heard from him for a long time, you don't want him sitting down at the end of the hallway with the rifle to kill the first guy that comes in knowing that the cop's going to kill him. So we shot it with the water shot and broke the door. And he was alive. Coming out. Stop. It stopped. So he ran out, ran across there, out to the garage, did a belly flop out on the lawn and gave himself up. <laughs> Alright, wait, you know, you gotta show that beginning of that again. So huh? this is this is an example. Show the Ari stick again. Same same video. Oh. <laughs> this is an example of them making something up that is actually really elegant. It's going to be hard to beat, although we can all think of technical ways to do it. A wood piece of window blind, right here. The bendy thing there is all about them wanting to know where that shot is going to hit and how far away they are for maximum effect. Right? You can have virgin lasers, you can have laser range. They stuck a piece of window blind to it. When it bends, they're in the right spot. Right, so you can see, we had uh, two disruptors, one there and one there, two different disruptors in case we went in there and had to shoot another door. We kind of learned our lessons. So I only have a couple more slides. This was up in Roseville, took a robot in there, guy went into a mall, big, probably one of the biggest, nicest malls in the whole Sacramento area. Went in there, had a backpack, told him it was a bomb in there, uh, got, went out, they caught him, and eventually um, somehow it caught fire. So they sent the robot in there to try to grab the backpack, 
the whole, this was a brand new robot. The ceiling <laughs> collapsed on it and it came out cooked. This one here, that's what happens also if you're not really, really paying attention to your terrain. And as far as saving lives, you can see here, this was in Moscow, they have a robot there. Why they didn't use it, I don't know. But they're suiting the guy up, they have a suspicious uh, backpack outside of a store. They suit him up, <coughs> you can see him walking down there, he bends down there to look at it. If, if you're going to work on a device, this is probably one of the most dangerous parts because if something there did blow up, not only do you get the blast pressure coming straight out from it, but then you get the blast pressure reflecting off that wall and coming back at you. So you get a double shot. And that's what happened. And it blew them all the way out in the street and killed them. So that's how robots save lives. That's it.